say about us You can laugh at our courage Take this much To have and to hold Continue to climb There are hundreds more just like us So, human knowledge Ordered human interpretation Correlates far less to that with which it purports to provide insight and more to the human mind itself. Um, to wit, the shape of human ideas is reflective of how humans shape ideas. And here we find the rule of manipulation preserved, although perhaps in a slightly more existential way than it was originally intended to be applied that in our manipulation of concepts we are demonstrating how we manipulate the concept far more than we are demonstrating anything innate to the concepts themselves. The idea of the thing is by no means inextricably linked with the thing and this is something of a matter of course but rather the idea of the thing is is very closely connected to the person who has shaped that idea. Now this gets a little bit muddled. This gets a little bit complicated. And this is where all those earlier comments regarding the nature of complexity come to bear. Because the human mind does not operate in a conceptual vacuum. The human mind does not operate entirely independently. Our concepts, mechanisms of comprehension, the way that we shape ideas, the way that we interact with ideas, the way we synthesize or analyze, is heavily influenced by other people. Either people that we have met directly, people whose shaped concepts we have come into contact with, and thus, by virtue of this general notion of inquiry as expression, come to some appreciation of their personhood, albeit indirectly any intelligible tracking of this range of influence, of this degree of interconnectivity, of this, this web work of mutual shaping would be so astonishingly complicated that it would either collapse into infinitely regressive complexity or singularity wherein we would have to describe human thought as a whole, as a species, as a history, as literal infinite complexity, or of absolute singularity. Any attempt to reduce it or complicate it, depending on which direction you take, um, further than that would result in the earlier mentioned problems regarding pattern definition, um, and generality, wherein the moment we have defined, we have proposed a definition of such ill suit to the subject of our inquiry that it has failed the moment it has applied, and failed far more catastrophically than it could ever possibly succeed. We find then that individual understanding of the world around us, of ourselves, of our fellow sentient beings, is far less contingent on the world itself than it is on other sentient beings. This is not to say that original or uninfluenced thought is impossible. Or perhaps it is. But, <clears throat> more to the point, very few, and if you're watching this, not you, certainly not me, exist in a context where it is possible. Rather, the question of originality, the question of absence of influence, is rendered effectively moot, first by the unique complexity, the unique arrangement of uh, nuances of concept. Um, there, there is so much contextualization, derivation, and deviation, and even a very simple interpretation that all must be regarded as unique. And second, and this is another area where we need to have a 
firm grasp on mutuality before we're going to be able to get anywhere. Um, the concept that a thing can be A and not A. Or, in this case, that an idea can be absolutely unique to us and by no means possibly unique to us. Even as this particular idea, this particular concept interpretation um, or experience of concept or interpretation may be absolutely unique. And we'll get a little bit into experience interpretation and experience of interpretation as we move further on in the series. We cannot consider this thing, we cannot consider this whether again, experience, interpretation, experience of interpretation, et al., etc. Um, we cannot consider it entirely our own, um, simply because of this perpetual, con uh, this perpetual context of influence. So having taken a rather detailed look at the relation between an idea um, through the means with which it was fashioned and the thing which it seeks to reflect, and also uh, taking a very brief look at the relation between uh, the person, their context, and their ideas. The most immediate question, and the one that we'll be looking at first, um, albeit briefly, is to what then may we correlate concept? Obviously first we may correlate concept to some degree to ourselves. Um, here again we find ourselves looking at the idea of inquiry as expression. Um, the shaping of ideas as reflective of the ways in which we shape ideas. Emphasis on we. But to what else? To what else may we correlate concept? It may seem trivial, <laughs> um, but I do think there is actually some worthwhile, uh, some worthwhile depths to be plumbed here. Concept idea is related to concept and idea. As we were looking at the ways in which we fashion interpretation, the ways in which we fashion conceptualization, we found that aggregatability, correlatability, transmutability, transferability were priority. That this was, if anything, the criteria with which we would assess the criteria according to which we would discard the vast majority of the data that an experience presents in order to fashion an interpretation or concept from that experience. That the ability to relate an idea to other ideas is the driving force behind this tendency towards reduction, this tendency towards filtration towards simplification, towards representation of things as constructed. Um, seeking that prime material from which thought itself is made so that we may reflect all thought as simply correspondences, as simply correlations, or constructions using that material. 